Grand Rising, beloveds. You know, one of the um, one of the wonderful qualities and one of the wonderful um, yeah, qualities of our Dr. Alice is her authenticity and her transparency. And that's what I love about her, and she's such a great example for all, all of us. So um, I'm just going to be real transparent with you this morning, okay? You can see right straight through. So on my way here to the center this morning, I got a call from my, gra my beloved granddaughter. She was 60 days sober, and when she was moved in, moving into a sober living home, the police came and took her to jail on Friday and, um, for an old warrant. And so this morning, as my mom and I were driving into the center, there was a phone call from a number I didn't know, and it was her. And she was calling to tell me how much she loved me. And she was calling to tell me to have a good talk today so, you know, I, I just, um, it made my heart swell. So, uh, <clears throat> so grand rising, beloveds. Dr. Alice reminded us last week that uh, that is the greeting that originated in the Caribbean. And um, it was used, instead of saying good morning, you say, say grand rising. And it's also the theme for this year in all the Centers for Spiritual Living, Grand Rising. I did a little research. I don't like saying things without knowing what it means. So I did a little research on it, and this is what I came up with. So it's a popular uh, greeting for three uh, popular re reasons. The first one is that some people say Grand Rising is more poetic and more powerful than saying good morning. And it carries a sense of strength and an affirmation for your day. The second uh, theory was that uh, people use Grand Rising because it focuses on the positive aspects for your day. So that's a good focus. The third one was uh, it's a scene as a way to acknowledge the spirit's safe return to the body after the night's sleep. And it also is a reminder to rise up against oppression. So whatever the reason you want to say grand rising, it's the good reason. It's, oh, it's all good because it's all God. The theme for this month of April is giant gentleness. I had a visual on that. I saw a lumberjack petting a little kitty. I, <laughs> I mean, you know, giant gentleness. Have, you can have your own vision, okay? I, I don't have to tell you what vision you can have for giant gentleness. You know, we all have those times and those moments when we know that we are connected with all of creation. We know, when we know that we are at one mint with the divine knowing that we are an expression of that divine. There are times we know that. I don't know about you, but for me, they're few and far between. I'm busy doing life and all the ups and downs that it, that entails. At these times is when we must remember the gentle, giant gentleness is a powerful thing. And this powerful energy is within each one of us. We each are able to have this giant gentleness within us. And we want to do that because we want to be who we say we want to be. I have visions of who I want to be. And it's saying that giant gentleness will move us into that place. We'll move be past judgment. We move past regret. We move past guilt. And we remember that we are a sacred activity of the divine. That's who we are. 
When we expand our awareness of this gentleness, we embrace active compassion and love in our relationships with others and especially with ourselves. So being gentle is not a weakness. It is a power that we all have and we all can use within us when we are aware of it. Are you aware of the gentleness that is within you? Sometimes it's difficult. Today's talk title is The Other in Love. Guess what? We are all reflections of each other in our relationships and in all of our affairs. Jahaladeen Rumi, the 13th century Sufi poet, says this, we are the mirror as well as the face in it. We are tasting the taste of eternity this minute we are pain and what cures pain. And we are the sweet, cold water as well as the jug that pours." End of quote. Every single relationship we have is a reflection of ourselves. That's pretty scary. As we begin to cultivate gentleness for ourselves. We begin to recognize love expressing itself as others in our lives. Our affirmation today said it all. Do you remember what it was? All my relationships are love in form. Do it together. All my relationships are love in form. They are a reflection of who we are. All of them. My mom has a friend. Her name is Mary. She's known, known her since the 40s. And her kids were in school with my brother and I, my brother Greg and I, and her daughter's name's Sherry. And my mom has been in contact with her her, her whole life. And we reconnected with her about 10 years ago when she moved to the desert, uh, into Palm Desert. So when we would go to Palm Desert to our home there, um, we would see her fr friend Mary, and uh, we go to lunch and to dinner, and we just had a wonderful time. She just lived up the street from, from our house. And um, about three years ago, she was moved into a uh, senior facility. Uh, she couldn't walk anymore or anything, so she um, was in Ontario. And Mom and I would go up there and visit her there, and at the several times when we were there, her daughter, Sherry, was there with her also. And Sherry was a, in between, my, my brother's two years older, and, and Sherry was in between the two, so in, in grade. So if I was in fifth, she was in sixth, Greg was in seventh. So we knew them for a long time. Right after her mom got put into the uh, senior living, she contacted cancer. And she went through a couple years of uh, chemotherapy, which was very, um, very hard on her body and everything. And uh, one time when we were there, she pulled me aside and she said, I, I just really want to give up. I really don't want to do this anymore. I'm ready to go. But I won't go because it'll hurt my mom too much. So she waited. She waited two more years, continued the chemo, continued the therapy so that she could stay alive for her mother. <clears throat> her mother passed away last year Two weeks later, she made her transition, the daughter. To me, that is total love and compassion, caring for someone so much that you wouldn't let them be alone without you before their passing. Um, yeah, it just, uh, it, it was, uh, it really opened my eyes to what true love and true compassion was. Marianne Williamson says, nothing binds you except your thoughts. Nothing limits you except your fears. And nothing controls you except your beliefs. What are your beliefs? 
you have anything you need you need to get rid of, it's time to get rid of them. And you're in a safe place to do that. Our relationships with others can really challenge our foundation and our principles, I think. How can others who are angry, hateful, hurtful, and mean be a reflection of me? I mean, I am so sweet and kind. How can that be? How could that be? And I know you're thinking the same thing. How could that be a reflection of you? Just not possible. The science of mind says that our relationships are a mirror of our own beliefs and our own ideas and our own judgments. Being angry or hurt is based on the actions or words of some, someone else is actually just a human experience, it's the human side of us. We know we're spiritual beings. We know that's what we are first of all and foremost but we're having this great experience as humans, and isn't it fun? I just love how the universe gives us all the opportunities to practice what we preach. You ever find that out? If you're praying for patience, then you get all these things that come to you to practice your patience. Or if you're praying for you know, abundance and all of a sudden your bank account's empty. Uh, it's amazing how the universe does that. You know, it's, it's showing us we need to have, keep the faith, you know, and know the truth. So I am driving to work last week. I'm driving on a two lane, you know, two cars, me and this other car. We're going the speed limit, we're going up the street. I'm just tootling along, going to work, not thinking about much. All of a sudden this guy in this big truck comes whipping around me on the right side and gets in front of me and waves you know what I mean, and says lots of pretty words to the lady and I in the next car. Uh, he was furious. He was so angry because we were driving side by side and he couldn't get past. He was such in a rage. It kind of shook me that he could be in such a rage about such a s small thing, you know, really. And I, 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 it took me back. And of course, my immediate human response was to wave back <laughs> and to say some colorful things back to him. But I didn't do that because I've been preparing for this talk. <laughs> and if everyone is a reflection of, your, of who you are and I'm going, oh crap, <laughs> not really. So I, I, didn't, I didn't say anything, I didn't do anything, I just got to work and I stopped and I took some time for myself and I thought, okay, if we're, if a relationship or anything, people are re a reflection of something that's not healed within me, what could it be? Why could I recognize that rage so much? And I had to think about it. And two things came to mind. I feel rage. <clears throat> against the suffering of my granddaughter for 16 years of being a drug addict. I feel rage against that. I feel rage against the judicial system that is really not justice, that it's just legal, that's affecting another part of my family. I feel rage against that. It's, it's wrong. And so I looked into rage rooms. Ever heard of it? Have you ever heard of that? I had never heard of that. Because I was Googling, you know, what do you do about rage, blah, blah, blah. Not looking at the Science Mind textbook first, of course. Looking at something else, looking at Google. Um, and it said, we have rage rooms around us where you can go in and express your rage. They have furniture and they have uh, sludge hammers and you can break dishes and scream and yell in a room, and you have to pay for this, by the way. You know, you have to pay for it. Uh, it'd be easier just to sit in your car and scream, I thought. But anyway, they have rage rooms. And so I'm thinking, wow, that's, that's pretty neat. So as I read on further, the rage that you feel when you're going into a rage and getting rid of the rage is, 
is momentarily. The relief is momentarily. It doesn't last. It could feel good for that, you know, couple hours maybe that you got, got it all out of you, but it doesn't last. What they said was what we say in our teaching. It was fabulous. Let me find out where I am here. They said, if you have rage, you focus on your breath. Breathing in, breathing out, calming the, calming the body, calming the heart. They said to meditate. They said to be still and pray. And that would bring you out of the rage and to breathe. And to be gentle with yourself. Wow, that's exactly what we say. Being aware of the gentleness within you can redefine any aspect of your life at any time. That's huge. We don't have to beat ourselves up anymore for those relationships were kind of bad and the experiences that we had that were not so loving. We don't have to beat ourselves up anymore about that. We can redefine them and move forward and get rid of the false beliefs. What I came to realize that the rage I was feeling really was a disguise for sadness and grief. It was just, so I, by, by redefining it and knowing that it was sadness and grief for what are things that are happening to people in my life, then I could bring it up to the light of truth. I could bring it up and redefine it. And so I did. Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of the Science of Mind, says this, there is nothing in the universe that limits you. Nothing, nothing. Or could desire to limit you. There is nothing in the universe that withholds from you because if so, withholding from you, it is doing it to itself. You are a part of the purpose. Spirit seeks, urges, and pushes us to fulfill itself, end of quote. We must remember always that people are doing the best that they can with what they have and that all beings are sacred and holy and we're on holy ground right here, right now. That all people are sacred and holy, it's something that, wow, uh, it's a statement that I not always like to hear or like to agree with. I see some people that I don't think are sacred or holy. So it is the time at that time to apply compassion and love to ourselves and to the others. We do not know what tragedies or what traumas everybody else has gone through. Everybody has a history as we do ourselves. I don't know what had happened to that man that passed me in that, that morning. I don't know. Maybe his kid was playing football. I was thinking about that. And got injured. And he was racing to the hospital. Maybe he just got a diagnosis that he didn't like. Maybe his wife just filed for divorce. Yeah, you, know, you never know. You never know what it could be. So I was able to apply compassion for that action that he did. Took me a while. Took me a, took me a while, took me three or four hours to apply that, but I did. And in that part, in that time, I could open myself up. His Holiness, the Dalai, the Dalai Lama, said the moment you develop a sense of concern for others, you realize that just like ourselves, they also want happiness and they also want satisfaction. Everybody wants to be loved and everybody wants to be happy. 
So active compassion requires focus and intention, intention. When your intention is to let people in your life be themselves and to love them for who they are in that moment, then those are gentle reminders to love yourself. It's not, a, it's not our job to judge people or to pass judgment. Loving ourselves is loving the other. And loving the other is loving ourselves. Years ago, Ricky Byers, who uh, sang at the Agape Church, wrote a song, said, I love myself so much. And these are the lyrics. I love myself so much that I can love you so much that you can love you so much that you can start loving me. That you can start loving me. So what we're going to do right now, and you do not have to do it, just like everything else, I suggest things. You do not have to participate in this. You can sit there in your meditation. You can sit there and just listen to everybody hopping around and singing. That's fine. You do not have to do anything you don't want to do. But if you want to join me in this chant, we're going to chant it for about three minutes. And I'm going to be walking around and looking at you while we chant it. I love myself so much that I can love you so much that you can love you so much that you can start loving me. Mary? Don't make me sing it alone. <laughs> I, I look back at the screen. It's not there anymore. I look up at the screen. All right. I can't hear a thing. Can you? <laughs> oh, no. Well, I'll have to sing it then. It's not going to work? You're not going to put the YouTube on? Ah, <laughs> oh, shoot. Best laid plans. Just be quiet for a minute, OK? We'll be fine. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Bring it in. <laughs> All right. Well, we're just going to have to do it ourselves. I love myself so much that I can love you so much that you can love you so much and you can start loving me. I love myself so much that I can love you so much that you can love you so much that you can start loving me one more time. I love myself so much that I can love you so much that you can love you so much and you can start loving me. Very good. You know, you think you have it all set up and then I just love technology. Those of you that know me know that that's not the truth. <laughs> Don Miguel Ruiz, in The Four Agreements, said that everything in existence is a manifestation of the one living being that we call God. Everything is God. Everything is a mirror that reflects light and creates images of that light. The real us, the authentic us, is pure love and pure light, end of quote. When we get too close to things, they can get muddled and they can get confused, confusing. Loving and respecting ourselves 
means to be clear on what works for us and what does not. That's called drawing your boundaries. Loving and respecting ourselves, we give ourselves the space to figure out what we need and what's not working. We give ourselves that space. Taking our feelings into meditation and prayer treatment will give us that space. Counseling and journaling are also a valuable uh, options to glean that wisdom. The Hindus say that when a person responds to the joys and the sorrows of others as if they were your own, he has attained the greatest state of spiritual union. In Taoism, I have three things to teach. Simplicity, patience, and compassion. These three things are your greatest treasure. Simplicity, patience, and compassion. Simple in actions and in thoughts, you return to the source of your being. Patient with both friends and enemies, you accord with the way things are. Compassionate towards yourself, and you reconcile all beings in the world. Those three things, simplicity, patience, and compassion. Giving ourselves the time and the space to figure out what is right for us is one of the healthiest and the gentlest things that we can do. And we do this for ourselves, and we do it for others. So in closing, let us remember three things. We are the mirror and the reflections of our relationships with each other. Compassion and love for ourselves and others require focus and intention, and I might add attention. And number three, be gentle with yourself. Give yourself time and space to meditate, be still, and pray. And your life will change. All relationships are sacred and holy. This gentleness is how we see those around us as well as ourselves. This gentleness, this love, this compassion is expanding and growing as we practice it, as we practice. And when we practice this gentleness, it expands and grows out into the universe and sends out good vibrations to everyone that we meet. Being alive, awake, and aware, we keep this energy going and growing all the time. Thank you, and so it is. Thank you.